Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them a little bit later. I just finished watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem, and I liked it a lot. It's a charming movie with charming characters. The art direction is fun and unique, action's well choreographed, the humor is humorous. If you enjoyed the trailer, you're gonna like this movie. It's a good time. That's my general opinion if you're just trying to decide for yourself on whether or not you want to check out this movie. I really don't think you need to be a hardcore Ninja Turtle fan to enjoy it, but you will get more enjoyment, obviously, if you are. It's full of fun little references here and there, but that's not the selling point of the movie. With all of that said though, it's time to get full turtle dork going forward. Spoilers ahead, potentially. I don't know. We'll see what happens. The strongest element of the film, the one that carries this movie more than anything else, is obviously the art direction. This was inspired by the scribbles you'd put in your notebook during class instead of, well, taking notes. They really wanted to add a teenage flavor to the whole thing, and that's a really creative way to do that. I remember Drawn to Death tried something along those lines. I never got to to play it. I really regret that. It looked really cool. But it also takes inspiration from the original TMNT Playmate toys, which were crazy when you compare the designs to everything else that was going on in the franchise at the time. And I don't think that's talked about enough. Some of the craziest character designs started off as a figure first, and they translate them quite nicely into Mutant Mayhem. And in turn, Mutant Mayhem has some great merch itself. Yes, I got all four turtles in the van. I'm weak. I'm sorry. This movie is ugly in the best way. And you're going to be hearing a lot of comparisons to Spider-Verse, and while that will get tiring, I promise you that's a good thing. I know the original Spider-Verse was a couple years ago at this point, but it takes a lot of time to put together a movie, so we're only now seeing the results of that first flick. And I'm thankful, and I am here for it. It's about time animated movies stretch their creative muscles a little bit more, and the sketchy art style blends in well with the comedy of the movie. Now, sorry if you're expecting a grittier set of turtles, but you're not gonna find that here. They dispel that in the very first scene they show up. Yeah, the city will be in danger, and again, there's solid action, but even at its most dire, the funnies come first. Those funnies mostly consist of pop culture references, and some might think that's too meta, but I think that just sounds like teenagers. Outside of some blatant spots of exposition, for the most part, the dialogue feels fairly natural. Kind of reminded me of a family-friendly Always Sunny in Philadelphia. What do you got there? 1991's delicious cream-filled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pies, fresh from the sewers to me. Are they made from real turtle? Probably. Or, if you consider Seth Rogen's involvement, super bad. Look at that, pop culture references right here in this review. If you're here for the art style or the comedy, you're in good hands. Just don't expect too much else. The movie lives and dies off those two aspects. But that doesn't mean it's not full of heart and isn't a good time. It just means that the plot itself is pretty straightforward. The turtles run into a group of mutants led by Superfly, who wants to mutate a bunch of animals and then enslave or kill all of humanity. I don't know, he's still workshopping it. And clearly, the movie itself is kind Kind of whatever about the whole situation as well. Like I said, it's very straightforward. We've seen these sort of stakes plenty of times before. In fact, we have seen the origin story of the turtles plenty of times before. And again, it's also streamlined, but I'm very thankful for that. The Ninja Turtles have had their story retold many, many times, but in more recent years, it feels like it just grows more and more convoluted. I'm thinking specifically of the IDW Turtles and a bit of the Rise Turtles as well full of reincarnation and destinies and hidden underground cities. And don't get me wrong, I do love those interpretations and I respect them for trying something different and new, but I also respect this movie for being a little more straightforward with the turtles. Baxter Stockman has made some ooze and however else they explain how that's made in a future movie or show, that's not super important to the origin right now. All we need to know is it got dumped into a sewer and randomly splashed over four baby turtles and an old rat. And depending on what turtles story you're going by, Splinter is originally the pet rat of Hamato Yoshi, or he is Hamato Yoshi himself, and as far as we can tell with Mutant Mayhem, Yoshi has nothing to do with Splinter. He is just an old rat who grew up in New York. There's no rules about the ooze needing to have some contact with humans and then animals or the other way around. There's no Ninja Masters or Foot Clan. Just a desperate old rat who became a furry and then raised some mutant baby turtles and decided to teach them ninjutsu because it looks like they only really had karate tape 
apes around. They did it simply for self-defense, looking out for number one. They're not supposed to be superheroes. They literally show the turtle stealing all of their supplies at the start of the movie. Splinter doesn't have a code of honor or anything like that. Yeah, he's a good enough guy, but he has an extreme dislike of human beings and really as a rat in New York, who can blame him? But this little family of five is all they've ever known. The only reason the turtles do anything super heroic is probably what they've gained from watching movies and reading comics over the years and well, they just want to be accepted by humans. That's it. They just want to be teenagers. They could change all this stuff in the sequel. They could add a lot more lore and all that silly stuff. But for now, this quickly explains how the turtles came to be and their desire to little mermaid it up and be a part of the human world. And while I do love the characters, I also wouldn't expect too much in terms of individual characterization as well. Leo gets a bit more focus, and since it's a new version of the Turtles, I guess it's now his turn to have a crush on April. I could joke on Nickelodeon about the Bay movies or the 2012 Donnie April crush, but kids, I promise you, they were doing way worse with April back in the 90s. Oprah, I've been okay. trying to talk her into an interspecies relationships for months now. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> yeah. well, Chill, man. And she won't do it. She huh? can't no, hold her breath. No, she can't I'm do it. Her. The biggest I'm problem is she can't hold her breath long enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, coming up, the turtles are going to perform their hit. Genuinely, I don't care if a mutant turtle boy has a crush on a human girl. Whatever. It's an understandable motivating force for a teenager. That's what drives Leo to go along with his brothers with the ridiculous idea of sneaking out behind Splinter's back to stop the mysterious Superfly. Because outside of that, Leo's a little bit of the outcast compared to the rest of his brothers. He's a teacher's pet and in turn a tattletale. And yeah, we see a little bit of growth in terms of his leadership capability abilities later on in the movie. And Raph does have a violent streak they joke about a couple times. Mikey and Donnie are here, and they're funny. But if you're expecting any wild gadgets from the purple turtle, you're not going to find that here. Their personality is teenager, and that's about as far as it goes. And for what it is, I think it's fun. As for April, she's down to earth and level-headed, and you kind of have to be when you come across mutant turtles. Splinter's just an old dad trying to protect his kids while trying to justify his dislike of humans. Superfly is Ice Cube, and he just plays Ice Cube, but also knows how to build wacky machines thanks to his dad, Baxter Stockman. <laughs> they don't get deep into that at all. They just quickly explain that away with one line. Again, it's fine. The rest of the mutants are mostly just here. They establish that Mondo and Mikey are good friends. I think that's the most character development either of them get, but nobody else really has proper time to develop. Not even Rocksteady and Bebop get any kind of special treatment. They spend more time being allies of the turtles than actual enemies, which is an interesting change of pace. They're literally living with the turtles at the end of the movie. Now, I did say there's not too much in the way of individual characterization, but as a collective group, everyone works really well together. The turtles are a bunch of hyper-energized teenagers talking over each other, but still able to understand each other without skipping a beat. There's a comedic, clumsy chaos to their amateur antics. These are some of their very first adventures, but their natural skill and teamwork still comes out, regardless of how bad they stumble at first. And that's the heart of the movie. They focused up on that first T in TMNT harder than any other version ever has. And they even hired teens to play teens. What a wild idea. And when it's produced by Seth Rogen, you kind of know what to expect. When I check out just about any other version of the Turtles, I tend to forget that they're supposed to be teenagers. Most of them are all ripped to all get out, and they all sound like adults. When I get out of here, I'm gonna... This is some nice steel. How about telling me who gave them to you? Yo mama. The Mutant Mayhem Turtles, though, they genuinely feel like teenagers. There's a fun energy to the boys that never lets up. And that could be a good or bad thing, depending on how serious you want this movie to take its story. Because even when there's a Godzilla monster on the scene, and yes, they reference Godzilla like three times in a span of five minutes, so be ready for that kind of chatter through the whole flick. Like I said, nothing ever feels too dangerous or too sad. Any bubbling drama between characters is quickly swept away under a mountain of jokes. But hey, again, that's fine. I know this is supposed to be a kid's movie, as I was constantly reminded while watching the trailers before the movie itself started. Still have no idea what a blippy is, but it really creeps me out. But it's still a very solid movie, and one of the better blockbusters of the year, and certainly a treat as far as animation goes. But as much as this thing will be compared to the Spider-Verse flicks, I gotta admit, it doesn't hit on the same level as the adventures of Miles Morales. And actually, now that I think about it, it probably borrows a little bit too 
too much from the Raimi Spider-Man movies in that final fight. I'm sure you're going to be hearing those comparisons a lot as well. Having regular humans jump in and be heroes themselves, it was a bit too corny for me in 2002 and that has not let up over 20 years later. But hey, that does tie in with the overall point of the movie, which is acceptance. And like a lot of high schoolers, the turtles goals aren't that ambitious, at least not at first. They just want to be accepted. They want to socialize. They want to be teenagers. And by the end of the movie, that's exactly what they get. They downplay the ninja part of Ninja Turtles so hard that they literally take off their masks and integrate into the human world. The whole world knows they exist. They attend high school and Leo even ends up taking April to prom. I gotta say, even if this is a sillier version of the turtles, in a way, this also makes them just a bit more grounded compared to a lot of the over serious ones that we have seen in the past. And I'm thinking of that 2007 movie where they played everything completely straight and I was bored out of my mind most of the time. Sorry. The Mutant Mayhem Turtles have very human ambitions. And while the individual characters don't always have a lot of time to get that deep, the interpersonal relationships do feel far more real than I've ever seen for these characters. They feel like genuine brothers and I'm glad the movie focused on that. That is the biggest shakeup in terms of typical turtle lore, but they do a couple of other things like changing the rules of the ooze. We haven't seen what it does to humans, but it might not do anything at all. As it is, Mutant Mayhem establishes that it affects animals specifically. None of the mutants here are human in origin. And when Superfly goes kaiju, animals just merge with him instead of becoming mutants themselves. And that could be just because of his big goofy machine. But outside of that, we actually also see the anti-ooze before we ever see the ooze itself. TCR just has that ready to go. They can just turn these creatures back into normal animals whenever they want. And it's only used once to solve the monster problem at the end of the movie. And TCRI themselves, they are set up as villains, but they're only here for a couple of scenes, and they're clearly only here for setup for sequels or streaming series, whatever else they obviously have planned for the future. And yes, they tease Shredder in a post-credits because what else were they going to tease? Possibly the biggest shakeup for me is uh making Stinkbug the stepmom of the Ninja Turtles. You guys thought the turtles thirsting for April was gross? Well, how many of you old turtle fans were smashing your Splinter and Stinkbug toys together, huh? Yeah, it's mostly here for gross out jokes, but yeah, you know, good for Splinter. I ain't here to yuck your yum. Go wild, baby. I do have to wonder how other long-term turtle fans are going to take to these drastic changes. For me, the concept of the TMNT was always weird, and I'm glad they went full weird with this flick. I'm here for it. And I know I sound super critical on some aspects of it. I do think I would have liked a bit more character exploration in some aspects. Yes, I understand that they're probably planning out a whole series from this one movie, but I can't critique what hasn't come out. And yes, I know they're announcing projects left and right, but also keep in mind that the writer's strike is going on and a lot of the folks involved with this movie are involved with that, so be very cautious on any future projects if they're not involved. But as it is, these folks took the Turtles in a bold new direction, completely different in many ways to any other interpretation of the team, and produced something truly special. This is easily one of the best, if not the best, Ninja Turtle movie out there. I still think I prefer the first movie. I think it's just a better movie overall in general, but that could be nostalgia. That could be bias. It's different enough that even though they have the same characters, they are wildly different movies and they both have insane levels of quality. And man, I just, I love this franchise. I love it so much. And I have another version of my favorite characters to love. And hey, if you don't like it, don't you worry. There's always going to be a new turtle interpretation just around the corner. I promise you. Before we wrap up for today, I want to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Jumping online and building up your own brand was always an intimidating thing for me, but Squarespace makes that a streamlined, fast, and easy process, all while making you look good thanks to their Fluid Engine, a next-generation website design tool that lets you tweak any of their many, many templates with easy-to-use drag-and-drop tools. And I don't need to tell you how useful websites can be, whether you want to build up a portfolio of your work, an art gallery, or a shop, because yes, they have everything you need to run your own online business, including analytics that help show you the strongest avenues of growth and help you build up marketing strategies, which include integration 
connection with your favorite social media networks. And they can even help you set up an online shop to sell and distribute custom merch. All you have to do is design it and they'll handle production, inventory, and shipping. Really doesn't get any easier than that. And to make it just a bit easier, if you use my link, squarespace.com slash game apologist, you'll get 14 days for free, which is plenty of time to see if this is right for you. And when you want to make a purchase, that same link will get you 10% off your first order. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video. But that is going to do it for today, guys. I just wanted to give my thoughts about the new movie. I know I do a lot of Sonic here, but truth be told, I'm a much bigger Ninja Turtles fan, and I was way too excited about this movie. I had to talk about it. If you'd like to see me cover any more Ninja Turtles, please let me know. Obviously, we will get right back to Sonic. Love that hedgehog, but wouldn't hurt to branch out here and there. Last thing, obviously, these videos would not happen without the support of the folks over on Patreon. Guys, thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me, especially right now. Channel's not doing hot. Finances are not doing hot. It's how it goes sometimes. That's life. And you folks help keep the lights on. You genuinely do. Thank you so much. And an extra special thank you to these fine folks here. Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Teenage Monroe Ninja Casey, Hatsworth, Tiny Jericho, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Sam Webster, Fishflop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Clover Chats, Haley, Dr. SP, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Com I, <laughs> I stumbled over your name, Stefan. I'm sorry. Oh my god. Stefan Placonica, 3 Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Lederick. We truly do live in a grim crisis, Coriate. Thankfully, we have people like Game Apologists to get us through it. Let us all twin. <laughs> Jimmy Duke, STR, the Lumberjack. Fable, what are, you, what are you doing, baby? Can you guys hear that? That's my blind cat. He's just wandering around the house in the middle of the night. Baby, what are you doing? Sweetie, go back to bed. Oh my god, fine. All right, I'm gonna go take care of my cat. I'll be right back. Anyway, NBTV, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, That Pyromane, good to have you back. Jin Sayotome, Bowden, I'm not reading that. Enerjack5, Grayson Conagher, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K, Ven101, Sindarin7, Haru Specs, Twilord. Did you know the skin on your elbow? is called a weenus. I am never going to forget that ad Cinco. Thank you. Is it <laughs> the cat's doing it again. Are you kidding me? Oh my god, Fable. Eric Delgado, Kodinsky, Sayonara Robocop, Crimson Rose. <laughs> I'm trying to just get through the names. He's meowing up a storm. Sorry about all the chaos with the names. You can just call me Nix. Sonic PAJ, Moonicent, Roxas the Cat. <sighs> Got my fill of cats right now, Roxas. Godzilla, Makuta of Salt. Sometimes you should aim. Alexander Watson, Neil Gompa, Conan Kudo, Sharif Pai, the Lex, the most powerful ship in the two universes, Native Nerd 27, Kaido Prower, Swift Cannon, Spearmint, Demetrius Prower, Omega Man 21, Pen Adelaide, Other Envelope, Jamie Torres Jr., The Phantomist, Silver Stars, Daza S, The World's Most Unironic, Eight and a Half Tail Stan, and One More Sonic Robot. Okay, that's going to do it. I will catch you guys later. Cowabunga, Shellheads.